Hello everybody, welcome to chapter 5, which is describing distributions, central tendency and variability. This lecture is going to give you the background information, much of what you probably learned in your statistics lecture class when you took that, um, but we certainly need to go through it and be sure that you are comfortable with it before we move into how to find these values in SPSS. So we'll start with central tendency, which refers to three different ways to describe what's happening in the center of a distribution. Uh, the three measures of central tendency are mean, median, and mode. Central tendency as a measure, any of those three, are some kind of measure that determines a single value that describes what's happening at the center of a distribution of scores. It becomes one number that represents your entire distribution of scores. In that way, it's what we call a descriptive statistic. It describes your data, it summarizes your data, and um, simplifies your data. So basically, no matter how many data points you have, if you've tested 100 people or 1,000 people, um, you would find one measure of central tendency to kind of describe that average score. And once you have computed a measure of central tendency, it's possible to compare two or more sets of data by comparing the average score. So um, if I have two classes taking Psychology 259, and I give at each class a final exam, and one class gets an average score of 80, and one class gets an average score of 60, well now I can kind of compare those two classes and say, well, the first class did better. Their average score was 80. So the three measures of central tendency, mode the most common score, median the middle score, and the mean is the average. Um, and you've probably done these many times. The mode is the most frequently occurring score in a distribution. Um, if you were looking at a frequency distribution or histogram, remember kind of our bell-shaped curve, um, the highest point, the peak of that distribution would be the mode because that would be the most frequent score. The, you can find a mode no matter what type of data you have, if you have nominal data, ordinal data, interval data, or ratio. And this is the key part here, this last point, is that the mode is really important because it's the only measure of central tendency that you can use for nominal data or group data. So if you're looking at groups of individuals um, for some um, study, if you're looking at eye color and you want to know um, how many people have different color eyes um, in who are taking Psychology 259 for whatever reason, I can get a poll, I can figure out how many people have each color eye. I cannot find a mean, I can't find a median, but I can find a mode. I can say, well, what's the most common eye color? So if you have group or nominal data, the only measure of central tendency you can use is the mode. And truthfully, that's really the only time when it's really useful. Otherwise, if we've got score data, if we have number data, we typically don't use the mode. So this is really important, and in SPSS and in this class, um, it's going to be important for you to know when you would use each type of uh, measure of central tendency. You don't have to learn how to compute it like you did in your lecture class, but you, can't, you need to know when you would use the mode or the median or the mean. And so if you have nominal or group data, you would be using the mode. Um, here's an example where we do have um, number data. We typically wouldn't use the mode, but what SPSS will do for you is just look at what's the most common score. So here we have seven participants, number of times people exercise per week. So person one exercises two times a week, person two exercises four times a week, etc. And if I were to say what's the mode, again SPSS will do this for you, but it's going to give you the most frequent score. And in this case, we have two most common scores. One is one of our modes because two people say they exercise one time a week. And three is our other mode because we also have two people who said that they exercise three times a week. 
And if we had, let's say, an eighth participant who also says they exercise three times a week, our mode would then just be three because now we would have three people who exercise three times a week. It's possible to have more than one mode in a distribution because it's just the most common score. So if we have a unimodal distribution, that means there's only one mode. A bimodal distribution means there are two modes. That's what we just saw here, where we've got two modes. We call this a bimodal distribution. And there can be more than two modes or most more common scores. There could be three or five or 10, depending on your data set. So we would call those multimodal distributions. Any of your distributions can only have one mean and one median. That's important to keep in mind, but they can have multiple modes. All right, moving on to the median. If you line up your scores in a distribution, so you need number data here, you need score data to compute a median. And if you list the scores from smallest to largest, the median is just the middle score. And when you have the median, you know that 50% of the scores are below the median and 50% are above the median. And the median is simply the middle score. Um, you're not gonna have to calculate the median, SPSS will do it for you. But just so you can tell, you would line up the scores in order from smallest to largest and then just find the middle number. That's easy, if you have an odd number of scores, there will be a middle number. And for an even number of scores, you take the two middle scores and divide by two. So SPSS will do that for you. Here we have an odd number of scores. These are the same number of times people exercise per week. And then I reordered them from smallest to largest. So we have two people with a score of one, one person with a score of two, two people with a score of three, and one, four, and one, five. And then I just would find the middle score here, which is three, right? Because I've got three scores below and three scores above. So this person number, this score number three is the middle score and that's the median. Um, remember the median is the middle score in your reordered set of scores, meaning they're um, in a line or in a list from lar smallest to largest. The median is not just the middle score here, which in this case is five, in terms of just being the middle number of your random set of data. The first step is to reorder the data and then find the middle score. Again, SPSS will do that for you, but if I asked you to find a median or what a median is, you need to know what, what SPSS is, is doing for you. Um, as I said, the median needs to be used with score or numeric data. One advantage of the median is that it is relatively unaffected by extreme scores. The median stays in the center of your distribution when there are some extremely high or extremely low scores. So if you have a distribution where you've got um, most of your scores in one area, but you've got one very high score or one very low score, you'll see that the mean becomes very skewed but the median stays um, kind of right in the middle. So it becomes your best measure of central tendency when you have numeric data that happens to be very skewed. And we're gonna go through an example of that in just a minute. The mean, you probably all have calculated the mean many, many times. It's the most commonly used measure of central tendency for score data. You need to have number data, so interval or ratio data. And basically, to find the mean, all you do is you add up your scores and divide by the number of scores. You've all done that before. Like if you were um, trying to find your grade out in a class and you've taken three midterms, you add up the three midterms and divide by three, and that gives you sort of your average score. So to calculate the mean, you add up all the scores, divide by the number of scores. SPSS does this for you in this number of times that people exercise a week, you would add up the scores, two plus four plus three plus five plus one plus one plus three, and then divide by seven. So in this case, it would be 19 divided by seven, and your mean score would be 2.71.
again, this uh, mean is the measure we use most commonly, mostly because it really gives us the most information about our data. Because when you calculate the mean, you're actually adding in every single score. Every single person's score counts in your calculation of the mean. So we think of the mean as a very um, robust measure of central tendency in that everybody's score is counted. Bringing us to statistical symbols, you might remember this from your statistics lecture class. Um, we can find means and standard deviations and all sorts of things um, on population data. We can find the same information on sample data. If you are studying an entire population, which is very rare, but you might do that at some point, if you were studying the entire <coughs> population, then the measure that you compute would be called a parameter. So if you found the mean, um, let's say, final exam score for my Psychology 259 online class, um, I could find that on my population. It would be all of you enrolled in my class. You are my population. And if I found the mean final exam score at the end of the class, I have the mean pop, the mean um, score for a population, and we call that a parameter. More typically, we find these values on a sample. Typically, a population is just too large, and so instead of studying a population, we study a sample. And when we find the mean or mode or median or standard deviation for a sample, we call that a statistic. Kind of easy to remember because the population parameter, they both start with P and sample and statistic both start with S, so it's a little uh, way to remember it. And this is important. Um, particularly when we talk about symbols, because symbols, if we're talking about a statistic or a parameter, look different. So for the mean, if you found the mean of a sample, the symbol you use is a capital M or an X with a bar or a line over the top. I don't know why my line didn't come out all the way, but we would call that M or X bar. You'll see both of them. Um, they can be used interchangeably. So if I were to say, you know, the mean uh, IQ score in my sample was 100, then I would put capital M equals 100. And then if I found the data on a population, we use these Greek letters. So this is the symbol mu. And if I found the mean of an entire population, then I would write mu is equal to 100 if that was the average. So these symbols will become um, important as we start to write about our statistics. So importantly for this class, which measure of central tendency is the best? Mean is most commonly used for score data and it's best if you have symmetric distributions. The median is best for score data when you have a skewed distribution, so when you have some very high scores or some very, very low scores. And the mode is most used when your data are nominal or a group. If you want to see how come the mean um, isn't very good when you have skewed data. You could work on this problem. I know we're not supposed to have to do any calculations, but these are pretty easy ones, so you could do this on a calculator. Um, here are our 10 participants, and here are their annual incomes, and let's say we're interested in average income in San Diego. So if you could calculate the median, and then calculate the mean, and see what you get, that would be great. So pause this here and work that out for a second. And if you do, if you calculate the median, first thing you have to do is put these in order from lowest to highest. So 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, 60,000, etc. And then there's an even number of scores. So between the two middle scores, which are I believe 60,000 and 70,000, you would 
add those up and divide by two and get a median of $65,000 as the average income, let's say in San Diego. But if you calculate the mean, did you see what happened? You added, added up every score, including this huge outlier, person 10 who makes $3 million a year, which is very lucky, lucky person 10. Um, but then what happened to your, me your mean? You added up all these scores and divided by 10, and the mean becomes something huge, like over $300,000. And then if you were to say, well, which is, those are both correct calculations, the median of 65,000 and the mean of over 300,000. But which is the most kind of accurate representation of average income in San Diego? Well, probably that's 65,000 because it's not skewed by this very huge outlier of $3 million, right? If we said or put in the newspaper, did this calculation and said average income in San Diego is over $300,000, everyone would move to San Diego. Sounds great. I wish it was. Um, but that's not very accurate. So when you've got an extreme outlier, you would use the median instead of the mean. In all other cases, when you've got score data, you use the mean. And if you have nominal or group data, that's when you would use the mode. All right, on to variability. Um, variability is extremely important when we're talking about statistics because that's really what our questions are about. Variability means differences. And our questions in statistics are really about why are people different? Why do people have different um, levels of anxiety when they take a test? Why do some people get higher test grades than other people? Why are some people more aggressive than other people? We're really interested in this idea of explaining variability. So the goal of variability is to obtain a measure, again, a single number, that represents how spread out scores are in a distribution. Do most people score similarly, or is there a very large difference in scores? And typically, when you describe a distribution, you give a measure of central tendency and then a measure of variability. Both of those are important. All right, so, and when we're talking about similarly or, or, or is there a lot of variability, you know, think about, let's say I give a, a final in this class and everybody in the class um, on the final gets an 80. Very, very unlikely. Um, but let's say everybody got the same score. Well, in that case, do we have a lot of variability? No, we have a tiny bit of variability. Um, in fact, we have none if everybody gets the same score. Um, but if I give a final in this class and some people get a 40 and some people get a 50 and a 60 and a 70 and an 80, up to 100, now we have a lot more variability in scores. So that's what we're talking about when we're described, when we're talking about variability. So as I said, the two go together. Central tendency describes the center point of the distribution, and variability talks about how the scores are scattered around that center point. Do most people score very close to the mean, or is there a lot of differences in their scores? And together, those are really the primary values that describe a distribution of scores. So in terms of variability, as I said, that's a numerical way to describe how much spread there is in a distribution of scores. And there are also three measures of variability, the range, the variance, and the standard deviation. Um, and we're gonna go through, again, SPSS will calculate all this for you. You probably remember calculating standard deviation and not loving it, um, but, SPSS will do it for you. We just need to know what these measures are. So the range is the total different distance covered by the distribution from the highest to the lowest score. So when you calculate the range or when SPSS calculates the range for you, you take your highest score minus the lowest score and that gives you your range. So if I gave a 10 point quiz and the highest score someone got was a 10, and the lowest score someone got was a one, then our range is nine. 
it's a pretty simple measure of variability and it basically uses your two most extreme scores, the highest score and the lowest score. And then you look at the dis difference between them. Um, SPSS will give you the range when you ask for range. Um, it'll do that subtraction for you. So if your test scores, the highest score was 98, the lowest was 23, then it'll tell you the range is 75. Incomes, if the highest income was 76,500 and the lowest was 15,300, it'll tell you the range is 61,200. Temperature, you, this is the one you're probably most familiar with if you use any kind of weather app. Um, it'll always tell you the low and the high. So those are the extremes for the day. So if the low for the day was 62 and the high was 85, it'll tell you that the range is 23 points. Um, SPSS in when we get to that will show you that you can um, have the option to ask for the minimum and maximum score. To me that's really important because it gives your range some kind of framework. So if you ask it, um, SPSS to give you minimum and maximum then it will also tell you hey the lowest temperature was 62 and the highest was 85 or the lowest test score was 23 and the highest was 98. I think that's really important, particularly if you're writing about statistics, because if I were to just tell you, like, let's say you are going on vacation somewhere, and I just tell you, hey, the range in temperature for where you're going is 23 degrees, that doesn't tell you much. That doesn't tell you what you should pack, right? Because it could be that you're going somewhere um, where the range in temperature is from zero degrees to 23 degrees, right? It's freezing um, and you should pack lots and lots of warm clothes. Or you could be going to a place where the lowest um, temperature is 80 and the highest is 103. And that's still a range of 23, but now you need to pack for very warm weather. So the minimum and maximum um, and the range kind of all go together and they're important measures of uh, variability. Now standard deviation and variance are more common um, that measures that we use. What does standard deviation mean? Standard deviation, standard means average, deviation means distance, oops, excuse me, between a score and the mean. So what it's telling us is what is the average distance between any score in the distribution and the mean. So the standard deviation is average deviation scores from the mean. If you have a small standard deviation, it means you don't have a lot of variability. It means all your scores are kind of clustered tightly around the mean. And if you have a very large standard deviation, it means you have a lot of variability. Um, and standard deviation is just simply the square root of variance. So if we ask SPSS to give us the variance and the standard deviation, you can check it yourself. But if you take the square root of the variance, it'll give you the standard deviation. Standard deviation is our most commonly used measure of central tendency, I'm sorry, of variability. Um, and so that's the one we're going to typically um, be using in this class. So if you look at these two frequency distributions, um, these are histograms, like we talked about last week, where you have score on the bottom and number of, freak, of subjects, or the frequency, here on the y-axis. And this is another distribution of scores, again, scores here on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis. By just looking at these two distributions, can you tell which one has a bigger standard deviation? Hopefully you see that the bottom one would have a bigger standard deviation. The scores are more spread out. We've got scores down here at zero. We've got scores out here at over 90. And we've got everything in between. That's a lot of variability. And so that would have a larger standard deviation compared to this histogram where we don't have anybody who scored lower than 10. We don't have anybody who scored higher than 70. The scores are more tightly clustered around the mean. 
And so this would have a smaller standard deviation. So the less variability in scores, the smaller the standard deviation. The more variability in scores, the larger the standard deviation. And you will notice that when you have a smaller standard deviation, your distribution looks like this. It's taller and thinner. That's representing that most people are scoring right here towards the, the middle of the distribution. Whereas if you have a lot of variability or large standard deviation, then your curve is flatter and wider. And it'll always be that way. When you have lots of variability, you have a flatter, wider distribution. And when you don't have a lot of variability, then you have a more peaked um, distribution. Here's another example of variability between two groups. This is looking at the height of men and women. And here's frequency again on the y-axis. Men are the blue bars, and you can imagine that these blue bars continue here behind the um, purple bars for women. Um, they're just overlapping. And here's the heights of women in the sample, and here's their distribution. So if I were to ask you which uh, group has more variability in height, what would you say there? Well, hopefully you said men. So men have more variability. You can see we've got men down here at the 55 inches, and their heights span all the way up here to over 85 inches. So that's quite a lot of variability. Whereas women, their heights start down here, same thing around this 55 inches. But we don't have any woman who is taller than whatever this is, about 78 inches. So women have less variability. They have a smaller standard deviation in height compared to men. And again, because this variability is smaller, this distribution is more peaked and thinner. And for men, they have uh, more variability, a larger standard deviation, and their distribution is flatter and wider. So hopefully that makes sense. Back to symbols. Um, mean for the population is mu. Mean for a sample is capital M. Sums of squares, this is important. You probably remember it from your lecture class. Um, we really aren't going to have to compute sums of squares in here. Um, so you can kind of ignore that, but the symbol is the same for population or sample, it's just capital S, capital S. Variance in a population is the Greek letter sigma squared, and in a sample is just lowercase s squared. And standard deviation in a population would be just sigma, and in a sample is just a lowercase s. So for our purposes, really, the mean and standard deviation are the two that are going to be the most important. And you will need to know the difference between population mean, mu, sample mean, capital M, and population standard deviation, sigma, and sample standard deviation, lowercase s. Those are the ones we'll really use in this class. Um, the other ways to describe a distribution are skewness and kurtosis. You may have talked a little about this in your um, lecture class. You may not. SPSS calculates these for us real easily, so it's easy for us to get these numbers. Skewness has to do with how um, close to a normal distribution is your data set. A normal distribution looks just like this one on the top, and this is from your book. This is figure 5-7 from your textbook. In a normal distribution, there is one mode. It's unimodal. The mode is right in the middle. Um, mean, median, and mode are actually the exact same thing, and they're the middle point. It's shaped like a bell. We call this also a bell curve. You might have heard that term. Um, and it's symmetric, meaning that the left side and the right side of the curve are pretty much mirror images of each other. 
So this curve up here is a normal distribution. Most of the statistics we run, we run and use um, assume that our data is falling in a normal distribution. But it's not always the case, and we can ask SPSS to give us um, data on skewness. If we have a skewed distribution, you can have kind of one of two uh, patterns. In this case on the left, we have what's called a negatively skewed distribution, meaning most of our scores are pretty high, but we have a few scores that are very, very low towards the negative side or side of this distribution. If you imagine the x-axis as a number line, right, and positive numbers go out to the right, and negative numbers go out to the left, well then in a negatively skewed distribution, most of the scores are high, but you have a few very low scores that are dragging this distribution off to the left side. And when you have negatively skewed distribution, the mode is always the highest point, the mean is the point that is most pulled towards those outliers. That was that example we did. Most pulled towards those very low scores. And the median is somewhere in between. And in a negatively skewed distribution, it always look like that. The mode is here in the middle. The mean is what is the score that's pulled most towards the skew. And the median is in the middle. For a positively skewed distribution, we have the opposite pattern. In this case, most of our scores are low, but we have a few very high scores off in the positive direction, skewing our data in the positive direction. And again, the mode would be the middle point, the highest uh, peak. The mean is going to be the one that is most skewed toward the positive side and the median is somewhere in the middle. So when you run this in SPSS, a skewness value closer to zero is saying that you have a more normal or symmetrical distribution. The larger the positive value is for skewness, the more positively skewed your data is. The larger negative value you might have for skewness, the more negatively scored or uh, skewed your data set is. And so typically if your um, data set is somewhere between negative 0.5 and positive 0.5, then we say the data isn't really skewed. If your data um, skewness comes out between negative 1 and negative 0.5, or between positive 0.5 and positive 1, then we have a moderate skew. And then if you've got a skewness of less than negative one or greater than positive one, then you do have a pretty skewed distribution. Lastly is kurtosis. Kurtosis talks about how flat or peaked your data is. So again, if this is a normal distribution, um, if you have what we call platycurtic data, that's very flat. And if you have leptocurtic data, then it's more peaked than a normal distribution. So again, for kurtosis, the closer your kurtosis score is to zero, the more it looks like a normal distribution. And if you have larger positive numbers, then your data is more peaked, more leptocurtic. And larger negative values means that you've got a more platycurtic or flatter distribution. All right. And as I said, you usually present central tendency and variability together. Um, typically, it's the mean and the standard deviation if you have scored data that are pretty normally distributed. So in this case, we've got two test scores. And if you calculate the mean, the mean in both, on both test scores is 80. But the standard deviation for this first test is 3.81. And the standard deviation for this second test is 15.81. So what does this tell us about the two tests? Well, we can say that both 
tests, people got relatively the same average score, right? They both scored an 80. But there was much less variability in this first test compared to the second test, where there was a lot more variability. And so if we just looked at the mean, we would kind of be thinking, oh, the two tests are pretty much the same. People are scoring pretty much the same. But we can tell now that that's not the case because when you look at the standard deviation, it tells us, hey, there's a lot more variability here. Someone got a 60 and someone got a 100 and they're scored all in between. Whereas in this first test, what's the lowest score? 78 and the highest is an 85. There's much less variability. You could compare that to this data, where in this case, if you add up these scores and get the mean, the mean is 70 for the first test, and the mean is 90 here on the second test, but they have the same standard deviation. So now if we were to describe this, we would say that you know students performed higher on test two with a mean of 90 compared to test one with a mean of 70, but the variability um, between the two tests was similar. So we need to, to present when we talk about data, both the mean and the standard deviation to give us an idea of what the distribution looks like.